Hi, I'm John Stevenson. We're going to be looking at the world of the Gospels, part five, in our continuing study of the life of Christ. Josephus, the first century historian, speaks of a number of different philosophical, philosophical sects. Now, um, a sect, remember, is a, a sort of a subdivision of a belief system. He says, for a th- there are three philosophical sects according or among the Jews. The followers of the first, of which are the Pharisees, of the second, the Sadducees, and the third sect, which pretends to a severe disciples or discipline, are called Essenes. These last are Jews by birth and seem to have a greater affection for each other than the other sects have. Uh, So notice the Essenes, they had a camaraderie, uh, and we're going to look at all three of these. First of all, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, since, since they are mentioned in the New Testament, and I think they are best seen in contrast one to another, the f- word Pharisee means the separated ones. The term Sadducee means the righteous ones, mean, from the Greek word sadak. Um, the Pharisees held to the authority of the entire Old Testament, as well as to the oral law. The, um, they had their traditions, which they felt had also been passed down from Sinai. The Sadducees, by contrast, as viewed the Torah, the first five books of Moses, Genesis through Deuteronomy, as having the greater authority. And, and so the other books that came later, well, they were nice, but they didn't have the same weight, at least in their idea. So they viewed themselves, in a sense, as sort of the ultra-Orthodox. Ultra uh, they were only interested in the first five books. What did they say about what we ought to do? And of course, what they say mostly uh, is about how we ought to worship. Remember, the laws and the laws of of living, but also the laws of worship, like in Leviticus. The Pharisees believed in things like miracles and angels and immortality. The Sadducees rejected these things. Now, uh, you say, well, how did they do that? Since Genesis... Um, actually, the the Pentateuch uh, mentioned miracles. They mentioned angels. They don't overtly say anything about immortality. I think they do, and the reason I think they do is because Jesus is going to point out something, but you have to sort of read between the lines to see that. But there are miracles and there are angels in the Pentateuch, in the first five books of Moses. And uh, you, you say, how did they reject those? I'm not sure how they managed to do that, but we're told that uh, both in the New Testament and also in the writings of Josephus. The Pharisees believed in a future resurrection. The, the, the Sadducees denied any life after death. The Pharisees were very popular in the synagogue. Now, that doesn't mean everybody in the synagogue was a Pharisee. Uh, actually, the Pharisees were maybe thought to be five or 6,000 in number. So they were a a very specific group of people, and yet they were popular among the people in the synagogues. The Sadducees, by contrast, had a tendency to be in charge of the temple. Now, that doesn't mean that every person in the temple was a Sadducee, but they were in the, they were controlling at least the, the hierarchy of the temple. Now, on this slide, I want to look at um, sort of, and notice there's a range here from the Sadducees to the Essenes. The Sadducees held to free will. That is, you get to sort of decide what you want, and God doesn't really interfere in that. The Essenes, over on the other side of the spectrum, uh, held what you could almost describe as a fatalism. In a sense, it almost doesn't... uh, no matter what you do, God's going to do his thing and, and just it's going to um, have its impact on you. And notice the sort of the central balance among these two positions are the Pharisees who maintain that God ordains things, God plans things, he ordains things from the foundation of the world, but also people, mankind, make real decisions. And so that's, I think, maybe sort of a mediating uh, arena I would I would suggest that the New Testament, when it comes to this question of free will versus God's will, uh, is, is in that central area of seeing, yes, God ordains things, but man also makes real decisions that, that are that are real. In the area of the life after death, we already noted that the Sadducees had, uh, their, their view was that there is no life after death. The Pharisees taught in a future resurrection and a final judgment. The Essenes did talk about the immortality of the soul 
and a final judgment, but it wasn't entirely clear whether that was uh, in, in keeping with a resurrection. But, but after you die, there is still an existence after death. The Sadducees said, no, when you're dead, you're dead. Now, the Essenes, we haven't talked much about them. Um, it's from the, the term comes from the Hebrew word, basic word, asaj, which means to do. And so these were the people that did something. Um, that's not to say that the Sadducees or the Pharisees didn't do anything, but this, uh, that was just their name. And they were a splinter group from originally from the Sadducees. You say, well, how can that be since a number of their views are, are the polar opposite? Well, uh, they would have seen themselves as the opposite of the Sadducees too. They had, they had splintered out. And one of their issues was that they felt that it was the wrong family of priests that were in the temple. Remember what had happened in the priesthood of course, all priests had to be descendants of Aaron. But then one particular group of priests back in the days of David and Solomon had been chosen to be the high priests. Um, and so all priests were descendants of Aaron, but the high priests came from a particular family within the Aaronic priesthood. But then that had changed uh, around the time of the Maccabees. Remember, the uh, the we have talked in an earlier class about how um, the high priest had been murdered and somebody had conspired to sort of purchase the priesthood. And when the dust settled from all the rebe- the Jewish uh, uh, people had revolted against the their Greek overlords, and after they regained their independence, the ruling party among both the priests and even the nation were that house of Hashman, the Hasmoneans, also known as the Maccabees, and eventually they had taken the high priesthood for themselves. Now, they were from the family of Aaron, they were, but they weren't from that previous Zadok family. And so uh, the Essenes were a group that had said, you know, you guys shouldn't be priests. Especially once they had become kings, uh, a priest and a king was supposed to come from two different um, family groups. And so they felt that the Sadducees had been corrupted. Um, now, another er- thing that they, that they held to, uh, at least a great many of them, I don't want to say everybody did, uh, but uh, cel- the idea of celibacy was not seen very strong among, usually among the Jews. In fact, the Jews usually didn't go that route at all. You know, you have certain groups, both uh, in Eastern religions and even among our Roman Catholic and Greek Orthodox friends that push Christian leaders in, in the direction of celibacy. Uh, that's not a Jewish idea at all, but it was among the Essenes. They also renounced all personal possessions, um, they had a emphasis on ritual purification. Now, all Jews had a certain level of em- emphasis there, but the Essenes went over and above. They, they took it not just to the next level, but quite a few levels higher than that. They are known for having copied the scriptures, and, and we know about that thanks to what are called the Dead Sea Scrolls. We're going to go to the Dead Sea in a second and look at that. Um, and they, they made copies of, a, of the scriptures, uh, as well as of their um, other Jewish writings, and as well as their own specific sectarian teachings. So let's leave Jerusalem and go down to the shores of the northwest section of the Dead Sea, and there we find the community of Qumran. Now, Qumran is what we call it today. That's an Arabic designation. I'm not sure what they called it back then. Um, But notice on the right side of our picture, we see a sort of an escarpment. And then beyond that, you see, it looks like mountains, but actually that's just the side of the valley wall leading up higher and higher and higher beyond that, all the way up to Jerusalem, because the Dead Sea is 1,400 feet below sea level. And you have to go to 2,500 feet above above sea level to get to the Mount of Olives that overlooks Jerusalem. So that's 18 miles uh, to, the, to the west. What, here's one of the caves. We're actually looking at cave number four. There were something like 11 different caves in which scrolls were found. This is the one that's closest to the Qumran community, cave four. Uh, an artificially constructed cave. Notice how it's got a sort of a level uh, ground. And then from the top, you notice uh, they've dug in in order to get to it because it's, it's rather difficult, unless you're a mountain goat, to get to, uh, to that, to that um, entrance on the side. 
You also find at the Qumran community a number of mikvot, these, these uh, ceremonial uh, pools that were used for washing. Now, all Jews uh, did, went through a ceremonial washing in order to cleanse themselves um, um, symbolically and ceremonially. But it was understood that just in the course of, of a day and a week, you would get ceremonially uh, impure. It doesn't mean that you would sin. Um, and so, and that was okay. You could do that. But then eventually, when you have to go to worship in the temple, when you go to the temple, you're going to have to purify yourself. Now, if you're a priest, you have to do this on a more regular basis. And those that were in Qumran did this on a daily basis. So, again, it was an over and above um, emphasis upon uh, this purification. Here's an artist's conception of this regular, regular um, purification ceremony. And because of that emphasis, people have wondered, uh, John the Baptist comes along, was he an Essene? And, and people have speculated, I don't think that he was. Based upon other things that he has to say that are very non-Essene when it comes to his teaching, um, now, certain things that they would both say that John the Baptist and all Jewish people, as well as the Essenes, would say that are that would be common, um, and and there are certain emphases upon, excuse me, repentance that he might have, but his emphasis is more on how we live in a daily basis rather than ceremonial purity. And so, no, I don't think John the Baptist was an Essene. The Essenes had been, were an isolated group. John the Baptist had sort of isolated himself. He'd gone out to the wilderness. And you can say, well, the Essenes were in the wilderness. But, but it was a big wilderness. It was big enough to have lots of other people. And so I don't, I don't see of any necessity where John the Baptist was necessarily of this community. 